Well, the accused 9-11 mastermind and his co-defendants caused quite the chaos at a hearing in Guantanamo Bay over the weekend. The hearing lasted a whopping 13 hours. This weekend's hearing for KSM, or Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and his four defendants was, or I should say co-defendants, was supposed to take just a couple of hours and could have really been done in minutes. Some of their behavior included taking off the earphones that provided Arabic translations of the English court proceedings. Interpreters had to be brought in to translate live. Interpreting the proceedings to yell that the, that the guards at the Guantanamo Bay prison were going to kill them insisting that the 20-plus page document detailing charges against them be read aloud. And then they took some of their clothes off, or partially disrobed, as the court put it. They read the magazine The Economist and made a paper airplane and placed it on top of a microphone. Quite the court proceeding. Defense lawyers for the suspected 9-11 mastermind accusing the government of rigging the trial to make sure he's convicted and put to death. Our senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, is here. What to make of this? Well, and, and, and not, not something to look forward to from the point of view of, of testing the patience of the, of the judge. Look, everybody is entitled to be present at their trial, to confront the evidence against them, and to confront the witnesses against them. That has been tempered somewhat by the Military Commissions Act, which excludes the defendants from hearing certain witnesses and looking at certain documents. But when defendants engage in behavior that unnecessarily uh, disrupts or lengthens to an intolerable point, the trial, the court can exclude them and put them in a place where they can observe what goes on, what goes on but their antics won't interrupt. So they can, by their behavior, give up their right to be physically present in the courtroom. You know, Catherine Herrick was at this hearing. Catherine, I, I wonder, uh, how, how disrupting was all of this? It sounds like a bit of a clown show. Well, it was. I was at the first arraignment back in 2008, and these guys came into court trying to control the proceedings by acting as their own attorneys. This time, they clearly came in with a strategy, and that was to frustrate and delay the process as much as possible. They refused to cooperate the, with the court in any way. They refused to answer questions, and then they refused to wear these headphones for the Arabic translation. But I would point out that two of them were reading The Economist magazine, and from what we can see, it's in English. So that was farcical. And there were other moments that were just kind of surreal. One of the uh, suspects, Wally Benatash, was wheeled into the courtroom in this restraint chair, kind of like Silence of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. And then once he was positioned, the guard went back outside and they brought in his prosthetic leg. I wow. guess the guy in the restraint chair was going to need it. I mean, you just were kind of shaking your head, not really believing what you were seeing. What can, what can the government do? Well, it, it's really up to the court to, to produce an orderly trial here. Now, this proceeding uh, it would be likened to an arraignment. I mean, basically, the judge was saying to them, are you who the government says you are? Do you understand the charges against you? Do you know that you're in a courtroom? Do you have a lawyer? Do you know what your rights are? Normally, this is in an American court is pro forma and takes minutes. But obviously, as Catherine indicated, with all this excess behavior and inappropriate behavior going on, it took 13 hours. The court can exclude them and put them in a room uh, where they can watch on closed-circuit television everything that's going on and enable them to speak to their uh, attorneys in real time from that room into the courtroom. But if the court permits them to stay in the courtroom and they continue like this, this trial will take years. Uh, and of course, they haven't even gotten off the ground. They haven't even picked a jury yet. They're still at the very, very preliminary uh, stages. <laughs> That but this isn't allowed to continue. Ju judge, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you. In Massachusetts banning bake sales during the school day and now wants to expand the ban to include evenings, weekends, and community events. I call that a buzzkill. But can government really <laughs> regulate you on what you put on your plate? Let's talk to Fox News senior judicial analyst and dietitian, Judge <laughs> Andrew Napolitano. Good morning to you. Good morning, Steve. Now, Good morning, Greg. Good morning. Now, keep in mind, they're talking about banning the sale of these foods for fundraisers, foods that are legal. Well, absolutely. I mean, basically, the state of Massachusetts has decided what it wants children to eat in the school and at home. And it is using authority that the Supreme Court of the United States gave to it, I'll explain that in a Bong moment. Bong hits. To do so. You remember that crazy case, Bong hits for Jesus? A meaningless phrase that some kid put up on a placard and, and, and held in front of a parade 
off school grounds and after school hours. Right. And the school disciplined him for it. And the Supreme Court said, yes, as long as students do something off school hours and off school grounds that might affect another student or might adversely affect uh, the school's mission, the school can regulate that behavior. So using that sort of amorphous line of authority, the, the Department of Education in the state of Massachusetts wants to regulate the behavior of students and their parents after school hours involving student bake sales and basically saying because cupcakes are not good for young people we don't want anybody selling cupcakes even if it raises money for after school programs That's so dumb sorry it's just so dumb it's unconstitutional and you got to you got to wonder does it have anything to do with the fact that Massachusetts was the first state to pass health care does it have anything to do with that i, I don't know the, the people in Massachusetts are claiming they have good motivation, that they're worried about uh, childhood obesity and they're worried about people eating I too get much that, sugar. But we, it's all about personal we responsibility. All get that. It's about personal responsibility and it's about the overreach of the sure. government. I honestly don't think the Supreme Court ever intended, when it said you can punish the kid for the bong hits for Jesus sign, right. that this type of reaching into the home by a school board would happen. And that's what's right. happening here. Can't we make our own decisions as to what we eat? Eat and not bow down to bureaucrats. Well, you got to feel sorry for the schools because these uh, fundraisers, the the, the uh, bake sales, actually make the money. And and going forward, they they need the money. Judge, thank you very much for dropping by and infuriating. Where are those cupcakes on Wednesday? I'm going to bring you one tomorrow, <laughs> just on purpose. Well, you have if you have a cell phone, you really have to listen up to this. Alarming new findings about using your cell phone after hundreds of law enforcement agencies admit to tracking Americans through their phones without their cons consent. Uh, that is not legal, by the way. Is the government violating your Fourth Amendment rights? I have a feeling of what Judge Andrew Napolitano is going to say. He's Fox's senior judicial analyst. Judge? The, the answer is, if the government does this without a search warrant, yes, it is violating. But how would I know? How would well, I know you, you, would, you wouldn't know because this device, and we all carry these, especially in this in this business, so we can be in touch with our producers and our colleagues, has a GPS device in it. And the government uh, has software which would allow it to access this GPS device and follow this wherever it goes. So if it's in my pocket, it can follow me. The government admits that it is doing this, but it is reluctant to use evidence obtained from this in a courtroom because that will place the, the constitutionality of its practice in front of a judge and then a series of appellate judges and maybe even the Supreme Court which will say you can't do it. Now, why do I say the Supreme Court will say you can't do it? Because in the past year, the Supreme Court came down with two rulings. One said the police can't plant a GPS device in a car where the driver does not have his cell phone with him without a search warrant. The other said the police can't stand outside of your house with some sort of a sophisticated surveillance or monitoring device that would enable them to find out what you're doing inside the house without a search warrant. So it is clear they can't use this to follow you without a search warrant, and it is clear that they know that. Is it a little bit of a slippery slope in that we all carry cell phones? We know that in, in most cases that they can be tracked when they're on. And so it's kind of out there, all this information in the universe. And quite frankly, very few of us know exactly what's out there and exactly who's taking a look at it. Well, it's a great question, Jenna, because privacy the right to be left alone, the right protected by the Fourth Amendment, is one of those things that changes as time changes. The, the linchpin of privacy, what, what is private, is what you expect to be private. Well, let me, so if, if we soon right. expect that these things will enable the police to follow us, does that mean we no longer expect privacy when right. we have them in our pockets? Well, and you have to think about the people, you know, the annoying people at the grocery store. They're having a full-on personal conversation in the fruit aisle. You know, and, and they're not really expecting privacy there, Judge. Well, so why are their they're conversations They're certainly not protected? expecting privacy in the end of the conversation that we have, but they probably don't think that the government is listening to them. But look, the government has better things to do than listen to a person uh, in the fruit aisle. We hope so. But do we really want to live in a society where the government knows everywhere we've been and can almost anticipate where we're going to go and where the government can use this to listen to a Very conversation that you and I are having even when it's turned off. The only way to disable this from becoming a listening device is to disable the battery. Oh. Do we want to live in a society where the government does that, no matter how well intended the government might be? Or are we so afraid of what's happening around the world that we want the government to know everything about us? These are some big questions, Judge. We're going to have to have you come back.
We exactly. Get the so answers. Yeah, I'm going to be watching that cell phone of yours. Uh, Judge, thank you very much. <laughs> sure. Nice to have you as always. John? And I won't take this in the grocery store anymore <laughs> just to make you happy. Not in the fruit aisle of all places. No. <laughs> Maybe ice cream. You've seen them. Maybe you've even helped out with one, but kids don't even think about buying from them. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Punk big sets. A new law in Massachusetts is about to kick in that bans the sale of sweet treats at public schools starting a half hour before class until a half hour after it ends. No sales allowed. There's a push to make all of this 24-7. That means that things like football concession stands could be mixed too. Judge Eddie Napolitano says this is the Lulu Zone. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Crazy. La I'm laughing at the gloom and doom of the background uh, Can music you believe and that? your narration, but this is very serious. This is not a law enacted by the legislature and the governor. This is an administrative regulation promulgated by some bureaucrats in Boston who have basically taken a Supreme Court decision. You remember that crazy case, Bong Hits for Jesus? Yes. Which a kid held a crazy sign up at a parade and was disciplined by the school, and he challenged the school, and the Supreme Court said, if it affects student life, or school assets, it can be regulated by the school. So Massachusetts has taken that and extended it to, since sugar may affect school, uh, student life or school assets, we can regulate sugar, even in your home. But a half hour before school, half hour after school, maybe push this 24-7. I could see the food police, but this is now out of control. I realize I'm talking to somebody who likes yodels and wingdings. Yes. But they are as American as apple pie, as is the concept of a bake sale, as is the use Thank of a bake you. sale to raise money for extracurricular activities. So you and I agree, your personal swipe notwithstanding. I, I think <laughs> that this is a slippery slope. It shocks me that it's in, in that state. But do you see others following? And, and wouldn't this be legally opposed or Well, the, the fact that they now want to make this 24-7 would basically say to parents and students, you can't even do this on a Saturday in your driveway as opposed to a Thursday afternoon in the school parking lot. So That's it's one thing if your kids going. party at school, you know, but now they're trying to extend this to anything. It shows that the government, particularly in the state of Massachusetts, does not recognize any limitations on its power. It shows that the bureaucrats who run that government think they know what's better for us and our children than they do. And it shows that they will use the laws to tell us how to live if our lifestyles disagree with what they want us to do. What if they had a baked apple sale? You know what I'm saying? That if it, um, if it were healthy fair or healthier fair in their eye, they would be okay with that. Yes, they would. Who would buy a baked apple when you can have a wingding? Very true. It's a wingding, by the ring way. Ding. Obviously, you're not <laughs> very up on the unhealthy. Oh, sure, you know the Constitution, but, uh, man, oh, man, when it comes to confectionery products, a little weak. All right. Uh, <laughs> I want to save your attention. <laughs> Judge Andrew Napolitano, there you go. Not so sweet development. Well, we're talking now about a major ruling, legal ruling, that will likely have far-reaching implications for anyone who uses a cell phone. David and Linda Kubert suffered horrific injuries when a pickup driver responding to a text message crashed into their motorcycle. Well, now a judge will decide whether the woman who sent that text should also be held accountable. Well, the attorney for the victim says the woman should have been aware of the danger of texting someone who's driving. What I found was interesting was her testimony at depositions was that she answered by saying this is what teenagers do. Well, Judge Andrew Napolitano is a Fox News senior judicial analyst, and he joins us now. Hi, Judge. Hello, Patty Ann. How are so, you? So, texting while driving is illegal in 30 states. Isn't it the driver's fault for reading and then responding to this text? Yeah, well, of course it is. Uh, the plaintiff's lawyer here that we just saw, Skippy Weinstein, I know him well. He is a superb plaintiff's lawyer. He's one of the best in New Jersey. He's very creative. But this is a little over-the-top creative to suggest that because you sent someone a message, their act of reading it is the cause of them getting in an accident. No one made him read the message uh, when it was sent. And of course, if, if this lawsuit is permitted to go forward with the uh, sender of the message as a defendant, think of the burden that would impose on all of us. We would have to know where the people we are texting and emailing are at the very moment we are texting and emailing them, lest we be responsible 
for what they do. That is an impossible task, and the court should not impose it on anyone. Well, yeah. Uh, in this case, the lawyer says that the person sending the text knew that the recipient was driving, but uh, as you say, this would basically ban texting altogether because people don't generally know whether the person is uh, driving or what they're up to. Uh, critics of this lawsuit say that this is a radical change in the law and that it needs to be addressed by a legislature and not the courts. Well, I agree. I mean, it is the legislature of the state of New Jersey and, as you say, 30-some-odd uh, other states that decided that texting while driving is unlawful. Only the legislature could make a decision like this. Receiving the text is unlawful while driving. Sending the text is unlawful while driving. Reading the text while unlawful is driving. But knowing where your uh, correspondent is when you send the text, nobody could possibly, uh, possibly know that. Uh, this is not a decision that a judge should make. My guess is that he will throw this aspect of the case out. If he doesn't, it'll go to the Supreme Court of New Jersey. I used to work for them. God only knows where they'll go with this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> judge Andrew Napolitano, thank you for joining us. Look, right to the source he is, right? Look at him. That's right. He's the source. Imagine that, though, if you were held liable. Oh. Because if you sent me a text message and I was driving, I would have had to respond to you. And let you know that I was driving. Don't talk to me anymore. Uh, I mean, would that meet the burden of proof? Or pull over. No. Or just ignore it. Let's just ignore it. I don't text. Shut it off. Put it in the glove <laughs> box right there. Six minutes before the hour now on continuing coverage of the president's uh, new position on gay marriage, that he is personally for it, though he goes on to say that the states should be the deciders state by state by state. But is that right, or has the Supreme Court already ruled on this matter? Let's turn to our senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, who suggests to us that, in fact, the Supreme Court has already ruled. How so? Well, in a very famous case called Loving versus Virginia, the Lovings were a biracial, opposite-sex couple who got married in the District of Columbia and then moved back to their native Virginia. And the police broke into their bedroom of their marital home in the middle of the night and arrested the two of them because Virginia law prohibited biracial couples. The case eventually made its way to the Supreme Court of the United States. And in that ruling, the Supreme Court invalidated the law that prohibited biracial couples. But it also said, your right to choose a mate is a fundamental liberty with which the state cannot interfere. Obviously, the case did not involve same-sex marriage, but the language is clear, and that language has been undisturbed by the Supreme Court since this opinion came down in 1968. It's interesting, Brett Baer was saying a little while ago, that the Republicans don't want to talk about this matter. They want to talk about the economy. Of course, the truth is, the economy is now, by most, by most observances, improving. Gas prices are going down, and we can forget history if we want. But it was the Republicans who used this very issue and these very votes with Karl Rove at the helm to get George W. Bush reelected. In, in 19, excuse me, in 2004, uh, the, there was on state ballots in, the, in November of 2004 when President Bush was running for reelection against uh, Senator uh, John Kerry, at least a half dozen states with proposals not unlike uh, North Carolina's last night. That drove conservatives to the polls to vote against same-sex marriage and while they're there to vote for uh, the re-election of George W. Bush. I think, and Brett knows more about politics than I do. And more than I do, by the way. But far. I think that this will be a hot-button hot button issue. Mitt Romney may very well have favored same-sex marriage at some point in his political career, but he is clearly against it today. The Republican Party will clearly be against it. The President of the United States is clearly in favor of it. The issue is, is it a fundamental right, as the Supreme Court has said it is? Or can the states make it legal in some states, but illegal in others? And if the economy continues to improve and gas prices continue to go down and sentiment continues to get better and the president's numbers continue to rise... This then will be an issue in November. We shall see. Judge Napolitano, thanks very much. Oh, boy. Meanwhile, uh, a stick-up? No. That's airport security. You know, it's supposed to keep us safe, but one lawmaker says it's nothing but a costly debacle that violates our civil liberties. Republican Congressman Paul Brune is at, uh, asking for drastic changes and demanding TSA Chief John Pistol, Pistol step down. Right now, we're joined by Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Uh, Steve. We, we have had so many instances of right. where the TSA... 
uh, you know, they've groped people online. We have an instance where one lady went through the scanner three times because somebody said she's got a cute figure. People stealing iPads. We have the two elderly Long Island women who were strip searched. It goes on and on. Look, the, the, the concept of the government getting between uh, a business, the airlines, right. and their customers, passengers, at the most critical juncture is, is unknown to us. This is the only place government in American society. Right correct, correct. So do we want the government responsible for keeping us safe, or do we want people who have the most to lose, which would be the airlines themselves, sure. keeping us safe? Nobody likes going through the TSA. In New Jersey, at Newark Airport has become so bad, as you know, we both live I in New know. Jersey, the legislature is considering legislation that would make it a crime for anyone to touch your private parts, whether you're local police or federal police. All right, let's talk a little bit about if, let's say, the government were to say, all right, the airlines, uh, you go ahead and you handle your own security. Well, the airlines have a lot more freedom than the government does. The airlines can do things that the government can't do. The Could airline... they profile? Yes. They... Well, well, yes and no. The airlines are not governed by the Constitution. The Congress has made profiling by private companies unlawful. In my view, the Congress doesn't have the authority to do that. So under a purest reading of the Constitution, the airlines could reject any customer that they thought would impair their ability to deliver services to everybody else on any basis that they wanted. Right. Stated differently, the airlines can choose who their customers are. Sure. But when the government chooses who the customers are and the government violates people's rights, we have this terrible confrontation that happens every day. Does the government have the right to touch you against your will? No. Did the Congress they ever... do. Well, here's the thing, Steve. Did the Congress ever authorize the TSA to touch you against no. your will? No. Where did the TSA get that power? They decided it. Correctly. It's because they, we got to keep people safe. They promulgated a rule. They published the rule. Congress declined to interfere with the rule. So they gave themselves the power to touch us against our will. They and like a nation themselves. of sheep, we accept this. We shouldn't. Here's what the congressman says. He wrote a letter to the uh, chief of the TSA. Americans can no longer tolerate the flagrant violations of their civil rights, which are occurring at airports nationwide in the name of security. More importantly, the corruption and continued lack of security among TSA's own personnel puts our country at extreme risk. The time has come for serious action to be taken such as I request your immediate resignation from the position of TSA chief. The safety of our country's travelers requires drastic change, and the time for that change is now. Con Congressman Brown, who is, a, who is a physician, was animated by, he got a copy of the background check that the TSA applies to its own employees. Right. It was nothing. It wasn't a serious background check at all. And then he looked at the number of TSA employees who themselves were indicted for crimes committed on the job. Right. And that infuriated him. And quite properly, he asked for Mr. Pistol's resignation. Plus, you add the fact that there are these stories out now that apparently even the most sophisticated scanners we've got could not pick up this new kind of bomb they devised out in the... Arabian Peninsula. The Israelis have a, a very a sophisticated way to do it, which is inoffensive and doesn't involve touching and involves eye contact and conversation. They ask a million questions. And the lines are short. 20 questions, just yes. like what we just did just now. <laughs> All right. Judge Andrew Napolitano. That, uh, that gym where they grunt and groan, is that yeah. where Kilmeade works out? I don't think so. He... <laughs> <laughs> All right, Judge, thank you very much. Pleasure, Steve.